All right, so triggers. They are basically stored procedures, right? They're just, it's a different twist on the situation uh, because we never call them directly to run. They happen automatically in response to events, events on the server itself. As we have two classifications of our SQL commands, there's two different types of triggers. Remember those three letter and acronyms, DDL and DML, data definition language and data manipulation language. Well, we have triggers in both of those areas. And we'll talk a bit about the DDL ones. We're gonna focus mostly on the manipulation triggers. So DDL events, those are the ones that we started off last term, creating tables and so on, right? So create, alter, drop for tables, views, store procedures, functions, et cetera, et cetera. All of those events, we can write some code that automatically executes on the system in response to any of those events happening. DML events, well, those are our big three, right, that we work with in sort of data manipulation all the time, insert, update, and delete. So each of those can raise an event and we can write some code then that runs in response to that happening. We don't ask for it to run, it just runs. Okay, uses of these triggers, what are they for? Why do we even have them? Well. The DDL triggers are mainly utilized by things like database administrators or project managers. When you have a team of people all working together, developing uh, a database system, you know, often what they'll do is they'll set up these triggers so they can keep track of who's doing what, who's changing things in the system, who's altering a table, creating a new procedure, and so on. And so in the code you write in these triggers, you might you know, just insert information into sort of audit log files, things like that, right? So you just keep track of what's happening in the system, you know who to go and praise for their excellent work or perhaps the other way around, right? DML triggers on the other hand, uh, they're mainly used, uh, of course, these are the ones that focus on changes to data, right? So they're often used in harmony with our auditing fields we talked about. And remember we talked about scenarios where you might even have very high degree of audit requirements, so you have to track before and after states of records and so on. So triggers work very well for that kind of thing because they can run automatically whenever you update data in a table, for example. Okay, it can log into some other table somewhere, information about who's doing what in the system specifically, even capturing before and after versions of records and so on and so forth, right? Uh, data integrity constraints. Just, this is kind of a, we don't encourage this practice anymore, but it's interesting from a historical point of view. Um, up until, uh, for example, with MySQL, it was only a few years ago, I think after version 4.1, if I'm correct, uh, that they actually had anything like our referential integrity constraints that we have, that we're used to using. I mean, when you set up the foreign key and the constraint, you know, so you don't have orphan child records, you can't create an employee that's not in a department, things like that and then the uh, ability to set up cascade update or cascade delete in those relationships. Well, that's relatively new for many databases. So it was all done in the past with triggers. So you'd write a trigger that say you're gonna delete a, a record out of a parent table, right? Say you have that, cas or maybe you're gonna update it, right? A, a primary key by, think of our department code example we did once before for cascade update. You're gonna change the code for a department. You have to go and find all related employees and update theirs. Well, that's the kind of thing you could do with a trigger, right? And that used to be the only way to enforce that kind of referential integrity. Now, we're encouraged not so much to do that because these new, more powerful referential constraints that we have are much more efficient. They're faster, okay? So we don't really use triggers for that, but you know, depending on the system, you may or may not uh, have other choices available. The other thing is that denormalized data thing that we've talked about in many situations if information is required with a high frequency then going and running a big query to find out the value isn't efficient so you might store it okay if you do more accessing that data than having to recalculate it right and we'll store that information in the system we've seen already that we can write procedures and so on and so forth that will actually update it you know if we update data through our procedure or insert a record through our procedure but you know the trouble is if people go behind your back, right? Don't use your procedure. How do you guarantee that the information gets updated? So that's another possible use of a trigger because it happens automatically in response to those data manipulation events. Okay. All right. So that's kind of what they're used for. A few things about them: how they're different from the other stored procedures and things that we've learned. There's no parameters. 
No input parameters, no output parameters, nothing like that, okay? As we said, you don't call them. They just happen in response to the various DDL or DML commands, okay? You can't say execute some trigger, okay? You can obviously cause the event that would ask for it to run, and that's one way to get around that. Now, you should be aware that triggers, of course, you're adding overhead, obviously. This is code that executes automatically in response to certain events happening. So, you know, obviously you wouldn't, you wouldn't be creating the trigger. You wouldn't be putting it in place without good reason, right? So there's a justification for it, obviously. But, you know, you should just be aware that there will be some overhead in terms of performance for having these in place. And, obviously, we avoid... We have better ways to do referential integrity now, okay? But you should be aware that it's one of the things you could do. Okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the data definition language ones, but I should just at least mention them and point out a couple of differences in uh, the create statement for this and the ones that we're going to focus on, the DML ones. So if you look at this bit of code, maybe it's hard to see from the back of the room there, we just have create trigger, a name for the trigger, right? And then with the, the DDL ones, the ones that respond in the system to things like a create table being executed, we have a choice of on either a single database or the entire server. Like, you know what it's like. You look in master database on the server, you see all these databases there, right? Scroll up and down forever, it seems, these days. Okay? So the uh, scope of the trigger really is those two choices. Okay? the entire server or in one database at a time. As I said, these ones are used mostly by administrators to track who's doing what in the system in terms of the actual design of the database itself. The event type list, uh, just a few samples here, things like create table, alter table, and so on, but you know, I think there's like 60 or 70 different predefined events that you can actually call upon for things, everything from alter index and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, in comparison then, our DML triggers, the ones that we're going to work with most, they execute in response to our three standard uh, action queries, insert, update, and delete. Okay. Again, we give it a name, trigger name, has to be unique in the database, we'll talk about that more. And then it's on, notice we have two choices. You can actually create a trigger on a table, which is what we do most of the time probably, but also you can do it on a view. We've touched before on the fact that most views are not really, they're read-only. You can't update them directly. Okay? But there are ways around that, and we'll touch on that a little later on. So they can be on either a view or a table. And then we have three choices. Uh, that's the scope. And then we have three choices of events to or ways to respond to an event. For, after, and instead of. Truth is, for and after are the same thing. Differences between them are immaterial. We still support the keyword for for backwards compatibility. So that we're encouraged these days to just say after. This kind of explains the concept a little more. So say you're responding after the insert of a record into a table. Right? The insert's happened already, but we can then execute some code. You should be aware that the trigger is part of the same transaction of the event that causes it. You'll see in a moment when we look at some code samples that you can actually give a rollback command right in a trigger and undo the actual triggering event as well. Okay? So basically we have after and instead of. Instead of is kind of fun. We can say, you know what? I know I'm, I'm here because you triggered it with this, insert, update, or delete, whatever. But you know what? I don't even want to do that. <laughs> instead of that, I'm going to do the code as I'm executing it here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Okay, so just a couple details there. The trigger name, the only thing that's kind of important to remember, it must be unique in the database. Hence, I follow a kind of a naming convention usually. Because these belong to or are associated with a given table or view, I usually start with the name of that table or view when I make up the name for a trigger. And then afterwards, I'll follow it usually with a description of what action. Okay, so it might be if it was the employee table and I'm doing a trigger for uh, deleting a record, Right? Then it might be employee delete. If you follow that simple naming convention, you'll always be unique inside the database and you'll be fine. Okay, the on clause specifies the name of the table review to which it's associated. I'll show you in a few minutes when we start creating a few of these 
uh, where you can even find them in the Object Explorer, you'll see that they actually are in a branch underneath the actual table itself. These ones belong to the individual table. Okay. The four option, as I said, that's really there for backwards compatibility. After is what we normally specify. That the trigger executes after the statement is successfully completed. So, you know, you won't hit your code in the trigger if, for some reason, maybe a referential integrity constraint or something like that prevents the actual triggering action from completing, right? We only have three choices here for our event type list, insert, update, and delete. Okay, so lastly, and we'll come back and visit this more with a, an example, but the instead of option is kind of a unique one then, right? Basically what you're saying is instead of this insert, update, or delete, I'm gonna execute my own code. Most often this is used to get around those limitations we talked about with things like views that are read only. You can't directly insert data into it. Maybe the view is based on a table where you have a join even, right? We can create a view based on any select statement. Just remember, don't include order by, <laughs> right? So it could have a parent and child information gathered together, summarized in some way. Obviously you can't insert into that, but you know, maybe it would make sense that we might Possibly, if you inserted the necessary required fields in the parent record first, then you could go on and insert data in a related child record at the same time. Well, an instead of trigger would give you that exact capability. And we'll look at some examples of how to do that later on. Okay. So a big question comes up, well, there are no parameters, right? So how do we have any data to work with? How do we know anything about what records are being inserted, updated, or deleted as we're writing the code inside of our trigger? Well, here is the answer. Okay? Temporary system tables are created by the system and accessible to us as we write our code inside the trigger itself. There's only two. Okay? So it's a little confusing when you come to update, but it's not really when you stop and think about it. There's two of them, the inserted and the deleted temporary tables. Okay? The column names in these temporary tables are exactly the same as the original table. So again, to use that example, suppose you have an employee table and you're doing a trigger, say, for insert, right? Then you can actually select from a table called inserted. It's a temporary table. It actually is in memory already, so it's very fast accessing the data there. And what it has is a copy of all the rows of data being inserted into the actual employee table. Right? But you can select from it, and that's where you can find out all the information you need about the data that's being actually inserted. Okay? If you're doing a delete trigger, then you have a temporary system table called deleted. Okay? And away you go. So you can use a select command, selecting from, inserted, or deleted. Pull values out if you need to work with them, maybe do some more manipulation of some sort. We know how to do that with a select. Create a variable, assign it, okay, as you do the select. Okay, so the inserted table can be examined with inside an insert trigger. The delete is available inside a delete trigger. If you try to access a, a table called deleted in an insert, it won't be there, right? You know, just have one or the other. So the tricky part comes with an update. <laughs> All it really is is you have both. There's no updated temporary table, but you have both the old version, the deleted, and the new version, the inserted table. So that's how you can find out, you know, if data is even changed for a given field. Pull values out of the deleted and the inserted. You can compare them and see if something has even changed, for example. Okay? And that's how we access all the data we need to know inside of the trigger itself. Of course, you can always run other select statements going out to the database and pulling the stuff in if you really need to. But the advantage of working with these tables is, whoo, they're fast. They're right there in memory already, right? We don't have to go out to the database right, and get any data, they're right there, and we can just often get away with that. So let's look at some examples now about triggers, right? Now here's a, a simple one using my favorite Nemesis sample database again, Northwind. Create trigger, okay, employee delete, reasonable name, on, so the on keyword, then we say the table review. So in this case, it's in an actual table named employees, Another example of terrible naming conventions. The table should always be in the singular form, not plural form. <laughs> or I'll come around wacky with a ruler, right? Okay. 
for which event? Delete, right? Okay. And then we just have our usual as and away we go to define the body of the trigger. There's no parameters, right? It's going to respond to any time we delete one or more records from the employee table. Inside here, we will have that deleted temporary table. It will have the one or more records that were being deleted by the triggering action. We know that we can delete multiple records at once if we want to, right? Depending on how you set it up. If your where clause that you're filtering for when you call a delete to happen is based on a unique constraint like the primary key, then yeah, you're only going to be deleting one. But if it's, say, you're deleting all employees from the uh, human resources department, right, then there'll be multiple that you're deleting all at once. So the deleted table will have all the rows that are there. So this code is just checking how many rows do we have? How many are you deleting at once? And our if statement checks if you're trying to delete more than one row at a time. This is a way you can put a constraint on saying basically, uh-uh-uh, we're only going to let you delete, delete one record at a time. Okay? Not allowed to do more than that. We can actually raise an error just to communicate the actual error message back to the user, let them know it didn't work and why. And then here's our key, rollback. I mentioned earlier that a trigger is part of the same transaction as the triggering action. <laughs> right? So if we just say rollback transaction, then that undoes not only any changes we might have made in here, but it rolls back the actual delete in this case. I've done code just like this. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, I'll put up a website online for, you know, as an example, like in class and so on. And of course, the first thing some student does is they go in, they delete all the customers out of the customer table, right? <laughs> they have no more sample data up there. Right? So what I'll do is I'll put a trigger like this on there. So if it's any of the original sample data, then I won't let you delete it, right? <laughs> you can add new records and delete them so you can see the whole process work. But, you know, just to keep the basics there in place, learn that the hard way. Nasty students. <laughs> Raise arrow only has one unit. Is that actually how it's written? Yeah, that's actually pretty much how it's written. Yeah. Just ignore like one of these? Well, I mean, uh, my, my <laughs> if was a little different, right? Uh, basically, with my sample data, I had you know, maybe 100 customers in there. So, you know, because I knew that it was an integer identity, if it was below 99, it was one of my original customers. In, identities are never reused, so I can just check if the primary key was below 99, and I know it's one of mine. Right? Anyone you create will have a higher primary key value. Okay. Anyway, altering. Alter trigger, well, it's the same as any other alter we've done ever since table, and that is you replace the entire logic with a new version of the trigger itself, right? So we can say alter trigger using the same name and just give a different definition. So obviously the idea here is we've increased the limit, okay, from one to six, right? We're going to let you delete up to six records at a time, but no more than that, right? So point is alter is pretty much responds the same way as our other alters we've been using lately. Now, you should be aware, although I personally don't find it all that useful, but you can actually check when you're doing an update trigger, is there even an attempt to update a given field? Because maybe that will affect your logic, right? You can imagine this situation. So if you're sitting there ad hoc writing some update command, right, updating uh, the employee table, and maybe you're going to change the last name of a given employee. Well, you can write a query like this, or a trigger like this, I should say, where we can use this built-in function. Now, this one is only available inside a trigger again. If update, and we can pass a single column name or field name here, and what this does, it returns true or false. If there's an attempt, if there's an assignment, you know, set last name equals inside the triggering update command, then this will return true. If there's not, okay, so maybe you're not even bothering to touch that then it returns false. So let's just see if you even are attempting to change the last name, then we're going to say, no, no, okay, cannot change the last name. We're protecting that column, so there's no m messing around with it. Okay, if you really need to change the last name, you'll probably have to create a new record and delete the old one or something like that, right? Personally, I don't find this all that helpful because the update uh, function here will return true even if you're not assigning a new value. Say the name was Smith and you're reassigning Smith again, it'll still say, oh, that's an update. 
If you think for a moment how I've given you those recipes on how we typically write our standard stored procedures, with an update, normally you write an assignment for every field in the table pretty well, right? So this would always show true that we're trying to change it even if we're not actually supplying a new value. But you know, you should be aware of that command that it does exist. We can disable triggers, okay? This comes into play quite often. Remember we talked about the overhead the triggers have, that there's quite a performance because these run automatically with every action. So, you know, picture a situation where you have some query set up when you insert new records into a table that goes and maybe updates something else somewhere, okay, one record at a time or something, right? It does the job that it's designed to do, works quite well. Now, at midnight, you set up a new batch job to process 33.8 million records and insert them all into your table. If you're going to have the uh, overhead of this trigger running over and over again, <laughs> odds are you go away for a week and come back and it's still not done its midnight update yet. <laughs> So that's where you would probably temporarily, in the script that looks after this batch job, disable. Disable the trigger. You can disable one at a time or just simply say all triggers. Right? And then just in your script that you're going to execute here, perhaps in a store procedure, you'd re-enable it again after your bulk import is done. Right? So just you're aware that you can enable and disable triggers one at a time or all of them on a given table. Dropping, straightforward, just drop trigger, trigger name, away you go. Okay, just a few uh, commands you can type inside the uh, script window. SP depends. You can pass a table name, and that will tell you all kinds of information about the table and its dependencies. And in, among other things, there will be listed what triggers depend on the table. SP help text. That's a good one to know because it works with other things besides triggers. You can do SP help text on stored procedures and so on. And it's way in a command to basically get it to do what I showed you. You can right click and say script as a create. Right? SP help text will give you back the original text that was used to create the object. So it's a way to examine what was inside there without doing it interactively, right? Because you can type it as a command. Help trigger is more specific. It just for a given table gives you information just about the triggers on that actual table. Just to share with you a few things that might come in handy. Okay, so those are our different triggers. I'm going to uh, go on here. We'll look at building a quick example, and we don't have a lot of time left, but at least we can get a start on it.